senior EU officials have joined a growing chorus of condemnation after an Israeli airstrike on a school compound killed dozens in Gaza City. The EU's top diplomat, Joseph Borrell, expressed his horror at the attack, which Gazan officials say killed more than 90 people sheltering in the school. Egypt and Qatar are demanding an urgent investigation, and the U.S. has said it's, quote, deeply concerned about the strike. Israel has repeatedly claimed that Hamas uses schools as cover in the wake of the October 7th terror attacks. Tabayin School, reduced to ruins after an Israeli airstrike in Gaza. According to an official from Gaza's Hamas-run government, around 6,000 displaced people were seeking shelter in the compound at the time. Witnesses say the school came under attack while people were offering dawn prayers. Israel, as usual, didn't give a warning. It strikes regardless of whether they're children, women, young or older adults. These were peaceful people in the mosque. People were praying, washing. Some were sleeping upstairs, including children, women and older people. The missile hit them without any warning. First one missile, then another one. We recovered them as body parts. The Israeli military has confirmed the strike, saying it hit a Hamas command and control center embedded within the site. It says numerous steps were taken to mitigate the risk of harming civilians. Many of the casualties were rushed to Gaza City's Al Ali Hospital. They dropped a missile on them while they were just praying. Fear God, people. Fear God, Arabs. Fear God. The strike comes at a time when mediators, Egypt, Qatar and Saudi Arabia, are pushing to resume ceasefire talks. But Egypt's foreign ministry says that, quote, the deliberate killing of Gaza civilians shows Israel has no intention of ending the war. Let's hear now from Laura Blumenfeld, a Middle East analyst, a best-selling author and former senior policy advisor at the U.S. State Department, where she focused on the Middle East peace process. Welcome to DW News. Now, uh, how does the U.S. reconcile its stated deep concern for the welfare of Gazan civilians with its ongoing military support for Israel? Uh, a deep concern indeed. I mean, this is one of these examples where the law of unintended consequences in war uh, creates some just disastrous consequences. Um, you know, as as the White House said today, although we understand and recognize that Israel needs to target terrorists, um, that they're deeply concerned um, and that Israel needs to take more precautions to protect civilians. From the American point of view, what they're using this for, hopefully, is to kind of give some more momentum for the uh, ceasefire hostage deal, that it kind of underscores the urgency. It's kind of a now or never time, which is why we're hoping to have a kind of diplomatic train of representatives from the United States uh, with this August 15th date set for this week uh, to finally bring the table, the parties to the table and reach agreement. But when it comes to putting pressure on Israel, has the U.S. lost its opportunity now to, to, to push Israel to change in course? In a very sad and tragic way, today's event gives the United States additional leverage and pressure because while the, there is this tragedy that took place this morning in Gaza, there's another disaster looming on their northern border with Hezbollah. Uh, you know, the Israel understands that they need the United States to back them up right now while they're standing and bracing for retaliatory attacks from both Iran and Hezbollah. They're heavily dependent on the United States for weapons and other assets, intelligence. So what in the best case scenario uh, this morning's event can do is to create some kind of momentum and incentive for the United States to say to Israel, look, we need some concessions from you to reach that ceasefire in Gaza. You need us more, in fact, than we need you at this point. And Netanyahu, it's time to seal the deal. That's the best case scenario. But do you think the Israeli government is interested in a ceasefire agreement at this stage? Um, it's fascinating. They, they, they would welcome a kind of 
hostage release, right, and security. And the question until now has been, you can't have both. Netanyahu has been saying, you know, we must pursue uh, this war to the very end. Um, and we can't stop short of and, and agree to a hostage deal if that limits us. What we're looking at now is potentially, ironically or interestingly, these hostages which are held in captivity do hold the key to unlock the region to a peace. Because if you do have that ceasefire deal, Iran will back off. You heard the Iran's representative to the UN saying we don't want to stand in the way of a ceasefire deal. So perhaps Iran will back off from its retaliatory strike. Hezbollah, I don't know if we can stop that train, but it's our best chance. Um, and of course, the war with Hamas would at least come to a pause, if not a final resolution. So there is this very fragile moment. And by the time we finish this interview, it could be blown. There could be a preemptive strike by Israel in the north of Hezbollah. Then all bets are off. But for the moment, anyway, my fingers are crossed. Mm. Uh, President Biden says he wants the war to end by the time he leaves office. I mean, considering, for example, the U.S. has just, uh, you know, provided the support, this military, fresh military support to Israel, is that kind of uh, dream realistic? I think either way, whoever takes office in January is impatient. For, for former President Trump, if he becomes president, his sort of message to the Israelis is, finish up and win, right? He likes winners, not losers. He doesn't like this idea of a kind of a wishy-washy Netanyahu. He likes somebody strong and decisive and in control. And then the same thing for the Harris campaign. It's slightly different. They're saying, you know, we set down this red line in Rafah months ago. That turned out to be our finish line. We would like it to end without the kind of pressure for this absolute victory. Take the win. You've accomplished enough. It's time to move forward. So I think either way, there's an impatience in Washington with Israel and Netanyahu realizes that, which is why these kind of final string of assaults, somebody asked me, are these in basketball terms, are these warm up shots or are they buzzer beaters before a game over? And I think and I believe that the reason why the Israelis are, have been in this kind of blitz of assassinations is they're sensing that this is their last chance, you know, go big and then go home. Okay. Uh, Middle East analyst Laura Blumenfeld, thank you for your insights. Thank you.